For a long time, the AOC 24 GTU has been my favorite budget gaming monitor. But then we got the AOC 24 G2 SPU, which effectively brought 165Hz up from 144Hz, among a few other features. Now we have got the 24G4X, which has got a flat 180Hz Full HD IPS panel, with adaptive sync technologies and support for HDR. Now at the time of filming and in the UK it can be found for just £150, while the 27 inch variant can be found for £170. So in this review you can see if they're actually worth their price tags and how they compare with some of their modern rivals. Now before starting this review I would like to point out that there are two variations of this monitor. You've got the 24G4X which is on review and then you've also got the 24G4 which is sold in other territories outside of Europe and the UK. Now the X model has got, in my opinion, a better looking stand, hasn't got that black and red finish to it. It also has got a much more modern looking OSD, which is very much appreciated. You've also got two HDMI 2.0 ports up from one, and you've also got two 2 watt speakers as well, in comparison to not having any built in speakers. Now more importantly, however, is the fact that the X model has got MBR sync, which effectively means you can use motion blur reduction technologies simultaneously with adaptive sync. In other words, AMD FreeSync or NVIDIA G-Sync. And in this respect, this might actually be a game changer for certain individuals. Now other than that, the monitors are absolutely identical. You've still got a flat 23.8 or 27 inch IPS panel that runs at 180 Hertz. So with that out of the way, let's dig into the results. Now first off, I had its input lag objectively tested at just 0.8 milliseconds. And while it might not look so good on this graph, you will be able to quickly decipher that the graph goes from 0 to 1.1 milliseconds. And yes, indeed, you're getting a phenomenal experience. Therefore means that it will be very much suited for casual gaming and also hardcore gamers who play FPS shooters, such as like myself who plays Counter-Strike 2, and therefore I had no issues whatsoever when it came to registering mouse inputs. Now similarly, the overall response time of this monitor is also pretty good, at least when you dial it on the right overdrive mode. Now for me to demonstrate this, I'm using the OSRTD tool. Now with the overdrive set to off, you can see at the bottom left hand side of your screen that the average initial time was tested at 7.03 milliseconds. This translates to the average D2G, which is often quoted in manufacturer's marketing. Now that's not exactly recommended and nor is the low mode which drops down the average initial time to 5.89 milliseconds and that's because you can see the percent in window is actually not that great. However, it gets really interesting when we go to the medium overdrive which is the one I would actually actively recommend. First off, the average initial time is just 4.26 milliseconds, which is actually pretty good. The percent in window sits at 83.33%, and you've also got pretty much zero RGB overshoot, which you'll be able to see towards the middle of your screen. Now you can actually dial this monitor to the strong mode overdrive, but this will incur a lot more RGB overshoot, and even in a potato looking game such as Counter-Strike 2, which still doesn't look as good as some more graphically intense games out there, it is actually a little bit off-putting. But of course, if you can put up with it, then you'll find that the average initial time drops down to even lower at 3.12 milliseconds. Ultimately, what I'm trying to say over here is that in the games that I was playing, I much preferred using the medium overdrive, as it seemed to give me the best of both worlds. Pretty much no RGB overshoot, while also giving me a pretty fast response time. Now you'll be able to see over here the UFO ghosting test and yes indeed over here on the, the medium overdrive you won't be able to notice any sort of inverse ghosting. However you can see it specifically towards the lighter shades on the strong mode overdrive. There you have also got the boost mode preset which effectively gives you the strong mode and simultaneously motion blur reduction technologies. Unfortunately here you have got still quite a bit of inverse ghosting but you can get around this by going on one of the other modes, for example, the medium preset, which is the one I'd recommend, and then using the MBR levels yourself. So from level one all the way up to level 20. And indeed over here in the latter mode, you will be able to see that the UFO is still very clear while also not having any sort of inverse ghosting. So yes, indeed, MBR will give you much better motion clarity. However, it's worth noting that it will limit the overall brightness, therefore making this monitor quite dim, specifically if you use it in a bright sunlit room. I'll be touching upon the overall brightness of this monitor and its capabilities further down in this video. Elsewhere, it is worth highlighting that with MBR disabled, the overall motion clarity of this monitor is somewhat subpar, specifically if you go at the lower refresh rate ranges, for example, 120 Hz or for example, 60 Hz. 
And in this respect, you might want to consider some of the other monitors out there on the market, specifically if motion clarity is one of your top priorities. For example, if you're a hardcore competitive gamer, you might want to actually invest a little bit more on a 240 hertz panel, be it IPS or VA, which ironically are made by AOC and also Philips. Now with that in mind, I really do love the fact that this budget gaming monitor has got MBR Sync, which effectively means you can use MBR simultaneously with the likes of AMD FreeSync or Nvidia G-Sync. Now of course, do bear in mind what I did mention about the variations at the beginning of this video. But in my case, the 24G4X was able to run NVIDIA G-Sync simultaneously with MBR. And this is actually very much appreciated because I was able to benefit from a tear-free gaming experience while also getting fantastic motion clarity. Now here I was able to pair it up at 180Hz at Full HD and didn't incur any sort of black screen issues or flickering. Now it is worth highlighting however that MBR cannot be used simultaneously with HDR, which is also no surprise. So therefore while disabling MBR and therefore enabling HDR instead, I was also able to run NVIDIA G-Sync at 180Hz at Full HD, and yet again I didn't incur any sort of problems. Now the overall HDR experience is nothing to really shout about. In fact, the monitor gets to roughly 300 nits, therefore not even getting to the minimum display HDR 400 certification, which in itself is a little bit laughable. Still, the overall HDR experience was actually pretty appreciated because the color accuracy is pretty good, and therefore means that it's something that you might want to utilize, at least if you have games or movies that do indeed run over HDR. So to conclude the gaming section, I would just like to have a quick word for console users. And here at 120Hz with the overdrive set to medium, the average initial time sat at just 3.97 milliseconds. And indeed over here, it is far more recommended than the strong mode overdrive because you're not getting any sort of RGB overshoot, indeed no inverse ghosting. On the flip side, however, you will have a lower average initial time of 3 milliseconds. The same sort of principle can be applied at 60Hz, where on the medium overdrive you've got an average initial time of 3.88 milliseconds, but again on the strongest mode overdrive this drops down to 2.99 milliseconds, but you will incur again much more inverse ghosting, as is perfectly demonstrated by this UFO ghosting test. I'd also like to highlight over here that MBR is available at 120Hz, but it's unsurprisingly unavailable at 60Hz. Now the monitor's gaming performance is actually pretty impressive, but what about when it comes to the overall image quality? Well here you've got a 23.8 inch or 27 inch flat IPS panel with a matte coating to it. Now in terms of the OSD, you've also got a dedicated sRGB emulation mode which locks the gamut, and also you've got full brightness controls, which is very much appreciated. Now in said mode, I had it tested via my calibrators with a gamut coverage of 91.6% and 96.3% in its gamut volume. The average LTE sat at just 1.47 and a maximum of 2.66, where lower is better. And yes indeed, this monitor can be used for serious image editing work, at least in the sRGB color space. Its tested contrast ratio sat at 1256 to 1, which is actually pretty good for an IPS panel. And you've also got the measured white point in comparison to the 6504 Kelvin target sitting at 6005 Kelvin at 100%. As for its gamma curve, it's a little bit off the 2.2 standard, but it's still pretty close. Now should you want the monitor's colours to pop a little bit more, you'll want to go outside of the sRGB mode, for example if you're not going to be doing any sort of colour editing. However it's worth noting here that in the DCI-P3 colour space it's not exactly accurate. Indeed over here via the gamut coverage and gamut volume they're positively affected, but you can see here the average delta and maximum delta go up to 4.86 and 10.97 respectively. The tested contrast ratio does not change, while the measured white point does improve slightly at 6202 Kelvin at 100%, but you can see over here the gamma curve is seriously off the 2.6 standard, which is what is required for the DCI-P3 color space. So what about when it comes to the overall brightness? Well here in HDR I clocked in 295 nits, while in SDR it sat at 288 nits, and this effectively translates at the fact that this monitor can be used in a bright sunlit room, but will mean that you'll have to probably have it running at over 90% brightness, which is not exactly ideal. It would have been great to see higher brightness figures. Similarly, it doesn't get all the way down in comparison to some of its competitors, sitting at 93 nits in minimum brightness. Thankfully, you can actually reduce this a little bit further if you use MBR or the boost mode preset, and this will clock in at 78 nits. Yet again, pretty good, but not as low as I would have expected for a modern panel. 
On the subject of luminance, this brings me on to brightness uniformity. And here, my test of panel did actually fare pretty well across the board, and I do appreciate this is somewhat panel lottery. The same could be said about the overall backlight bleed, which I found perfectly acceptable, specifically given that it is an IPS panel. However, you will notice that there is a bit of bleed. And in this respect, if it's something that you're overly sensitive towards, or indeed if you consume a lot of dark games or movies, then you might want to look at a VA or TN panel. The former being the better out of the two because you'll get much better contrast ratios. Past all these tests, let's talk about its build quality. And here you've got a three side ballless design with a relatively thin bottom bezel. I also love the fact that the X model has got that blacked out design and therefore will fit in most sort of desktop setups. On that note, you've also got a pretty ergonomic stand, not only in terms of its design, which hasn't got that triangular shape, but also in terms of the adjustments that it provides, which is very much appreciated at this budget price. You've got height, tilt, pivot, and swivel adjustments. And in fact, you can rotate it both ways, which is a bit of a novelty. Elsewhere, you can also replace the stand if you so wish with a Visa compatible stand, for example, if you want to place it on a monitor arm or indeed a multi-monitor setup. Aside from all this, there are a few physical buttons at the bottom right hand side of the monitor and these allow you to access the OSD. Yes indeed, the monitor's settings have been spruced up in comparison to the previous generation models and it's very much appreciated. And while you still actually have all the comprehensively laid out options and makes it very easy to understand. Now you might have also clocked in an audio option. And yes indeed, in the non-X model, you'll have a 3.5mm jack allowing you to output audio to headphones, but in the X model, you've got two 2 watt speakers built in. They will suffice for basic Windows notification or basic music listening, but if you do want some better audio experience, I'd definitely suggest you to get some bookshelf speakers, headphones, DAC, or indeed a headset, which will give you a far superior audio listening experience. Now in terms of connectivity, you've got a single DisplayPort 1.4 input and two HDMI 2.0 ports, which are very much appreciated because these will able to feed through the maximum refresh rate and resolution of this monitor, which is 1080p at 180 Hertz. And just as a reminder, you've only got a singular HDMI port in the non-X variant. So with all that in mind, it brings me on to my verdict. And truthfully, I absolutely love the AOC 24 g 4 x it has got a low input lag, a good response time, specifically for a 180Hz panel. It's also got MBR, which can be used simultaneously with adaptive sync technologies. You've also got a color accurate IPS panel, at least in the sRGB color space, a comprehensively laid out OSD, and also great sort of ergonomics. Couple all of this at a budget price, and it makes this monitor an easy recommendation. As such, it gets my best buy award. That is worth considering, however, that you have got its predecessors, which come in at 165 and 144 hertz. These are still fantastic budget gaming monitors, and if you can find them at a cheaper price point, you might want to consider them, specifically if that high refresh rate is not your top priority. And if it is, then you might want to look at 240 hertz IPS or VA panels, which aren't exactly all that more expensive than the 24G4X, some of which I've reviewed and will be down description below for your own consideration. Now I'd be curious to know what you make of the 24 or 27 G4 or G4X in the comment section below. And of course, if you've enjoyed this detailed independent review, definitely do consider dropping a like, subscribing and hitting that bell notification. All of which would be greatly appreciated and allows me to continue delivering independent, honest reviews like this one. As such, I've been totally dubbed and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.